200 years old. Wow. It's, it's still being used. No, oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Pretty cool. Yeah. It's what is your name? name? My maiden name, Antel. A N T E L L. Wow. That's cool. Yeah, over there it was ant, uh, on a lot of the gravestones and back of the church. It mm -hmm. was Antus at that time, mm -hmm. A N T U S. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we, my cousin took us to the, the family Lutheran church. Yeah. You should see the inside. It was so yeah. full of gold. It was just wow. amazing. Great big pulpit. I, you know, it just it was so awesome. That is cool. That is very cool. What one thing that I found too with the churches is, uh, as I told you, Bill, um, that all of the Lutheran churches are maintained and paid for by the state, and all the pastors are paid; uh, their salaries are paid by the state. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yes, there's a long history to that, and it's similar in most of the European, Scandinavian countries. Um, Germany, even England, um, you know, the Church of England, mm -hmm. some of the past, some, you know, but uh, Germany's, they're all a little different, but in essence, it isn't the people who attend that church making donations that keeps it going. It's through the tax. I guess you can even choose like, in, like whether you want to pay the church tax and you know all the different these types things. yeah these types of things and it's not really a good way to keep the church going in the long run as i think we can see um <laughs> kind of makes people complacent you know mm -hmm. um, and uh if you don't have to keep it going yourself you know yeah <laughs> so now they have tons of churches that no one ever goes to and people get confirmed and baptized confirmed and married and buried that's basically what the church pastors do. Mm. So, yeah. Well, we went during the week, you know, yeah. we got permission and the uh, caretaker took us in. Yeah. And so told them we were from the States, you know, and so yeah. he was happy to take us in. Yeah. Well. Oh, sure. It's amazing. Well, I pray for a revitalization. They've really gone the secular world route, which we tend to be headed down that road a bit, but not perhaps to the extent they are, um, you know, yeah. Um, sorry, I got a kink in my neck today, so I'm doing a little self-massage mm. here. Go get Yvonne, she'll, <laughs> yeah, she'll, she'll, she'll get rub it, going. it out for you. Um, so, yeah, I think it's fascinating. But it's, it's the same thing that happens to a church that has a massive endowment, like, you know, like some churches in the inner city, I know in San Francisco, you know, had, you know, 10 million, because every, you know, all this generation, they left so much money, the church, they had $10 million endowments, and they wow. pay the pastor's salary from those, so, and they don't have it restricted, you know, you, you know, like we have an endowment fund here, it's, it doesn't, it's, I don't know, it's a little less than 100,000, I think, or 80,000, but it can only be fun, special projects, it can't be used for, for, paying for, the for the, normal expenses of our ministry which is yeah. good can i use but it anyway. for costco yeah <laughs> yeah that's a special project um and then uh you know they just so you got churches that have 10 people coming on a sunday and, but everything's taken care of because they they've got this massive endowment and, yeah that they live off of so, yeah wow. anyway so it's not really a good thing um, I've told the story many times about the Finnish pastor who came here to help me with the memorial service for somebody that was very Finnish in there. And she was from, she was a chaplain over in Seattle. So she came over to do the benediction in, in his native tongue and stuff. Oh. And she walked in the narthex and her jaw dropped because she said, who pays for this? Oh, really? Yeah. And I said, I said, the people who attend here pay for this. She was like, she was she couldn't believe it. Yeah, oh, she couldn't believe it. Yeah. All right, enough of that. Very good. Well, yes, great trips. Great. Ace, glad you're back. You're doing a little better. We're praying for your help as you go forward. Um, we uh, are moving on in the summer. I can't believe we're in halfway through August. 
I know it. It's, it always goes too fast. It's, as you get older, the years go faster, but especially that summer. Right. That's right. <laughs> Here, so. But it can be a little cooler. It could be a little cooler. It's going to cool off. I think, what do we got? We got another couple today and tomorrow. Today's the worst, 90, low 90s. I feel for people that don't have some form of air conditioning. Yeah, my house is air conditioned. Yeah. I'm so We thankful. took the plunge last year, so we're, we're sure thankful. I used to have to get up like on these 80 degree days. I'd get up at the crack of dawn, you know, get the fans outside, yeah. blowing fans in there. And then you got as soon as I'd look at the thermostat temperature and the outdoor temperature, as soon as they got even, I'd shut everything down and shut the blinds. Yeah. Uh, it, and it, it, it worked okay in the low 80s, but, yeah. but the, when it's when in the it gets 90s, to, yeah, when it you're, gets to you're 90. toast. Yeah. And then, of course, everybody in my neighborhood wants to either have campfires at night or they smoke or the one guy started his diesel truck because he had to go to work and he'd fill the whole neighborhood with diesel fumes. And of course, we're just blasting air and since I wake up in the middle of the night. Ah. <laughs> so anyway, so now I have the luxury, privilege of having. Yeah. Some cool air and a nice filter. All right, enough of that. I am sharing the, the screen here, and we are going to be working in Matthew today, uh, some challenging stuff. Uh, we're actually going to go back to verse 10, 15, verse 10. Um, and then we're I want to get to Romans, so we need to get cracking here. Let's get to Romans. Uh, it's probably maybe one of the most important chapters in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 11. So with that, I'll open us with a prayer. Gracious and loving God, um, we are unworthy, although we know we are worth everything to you. And we um, give thanks for the gift of faith that you've given us. And so continue to nurture that gift and strengthen it as we are in your word together here in person and from our homes. And we give thanks for this technology and the ability to do this today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So we got 10 through 20 and then 21 through um, 28. So why don't we get somebody to do 10 through 20? And then we'll get have somebody do 21. What do we got? I'll do 21. Okay, you'll do 21. Ross has got 10. Go, you start us off, Ross. And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand, <clears throat> not that which goeth into the mouth defileth the man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth the man. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone, they they be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the draught? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil, evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. These are the things which, which defile a man, but, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. Boy, my twenty-one is so different. That's okay, yeah. It's... The faith of the Canaanite woman. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew in the region of Tyre and said to them, a Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. 
Lovely, thank you. Okay, so as we usually start, what uh, comes out at you? Yeah, <laughs> what grabs your attention? I think I know, but uh, no, what grabs your attention in the, either of those paragraphs? Once again, the disciples don't understand something. Yes, you still not understand. They didn't get it for a long, long time in the yeah. Bible. I don't yeah. think. <laughs> the yes. beauty of the situation. Yeah. Even all the miracles that Jesus performed, that they still couldn't believe, you know? It was crazy. It is Where interesting. Is this, yeah. Where is this in relationship to his three years of ministry? So this... That's a good question. So the three years actually comes from the Gospel of John. In the synoptics, as far as we would know, it's a one-year ministry. So oh. we, um, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But we, John has three <laughs> Passovers, you know. And so, um, and I'm not so sure that John isn't more on target there. Um, John is very attentive to those festivals and what's happening. But uh, nonetheless, we're now move, getting closer to um, the end of his kind of teaching public ministry before he heads to Jerusalem. We're getting closer. 16th chapter, you know, um, if we just put up a little, uh, um, we've got, you know, by the time we get to chapter 19, um, Trump, yeah, 21 is the triumphant entry. So we're getting closer, but 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 he's going the opposite direction at this point. So um Tyre and Sidon, if I put up a map here, let's do that. Not Jacob, let's get to Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Um, here we go. Jesus, John, ministry in Galilee, commission, 5,000 visits. Um, there we go. So here you see um, Sea of Galilee, Capernaum. And so Tyre, and look out, it's like 30 miles. Wow. This is not just a little uh you know sure. couple hour walk this is a long journey yeah and uh and so these are gentile areas um these are areas that are now in S syria um so did he leave from sidon so he goes up to Tyre, goes up to Sidon, comes back down, comes back down. and then, in depending on whose gospel, you, then he heads over to Caesarea Philippi, and would come back down here. So he's been doing ministry. You know, Nazareth is is down lower, so he's mm -hmm. gone back and forth and worked here. Um, so it's a purple. The, uh, the part of his journey as well? Um, it is, but it's the next one, I believe. Let's see. Let me go get to the maps. Uh, well, I guess it doesn't have a little... I guess it doesn't have a... Um, but I think that these are just different segments. So we, we're told about this one, Tyre, Sidon, and then... Caesarea Philippi and then after Caesarea and Philippi he comes down here so these are just different this is the route though he went up mm -hmm. and then down and over and then back okay. so yeah yeah wow yeah so so that's kind of where we're at in the you know the the transition of things Margo good question I hope that answered your question <laughs> well travel there wasn't like it is today so even the 30 mile and then you have to rest and all you're talking, you know. That's a many, yeah, that's a many day journey for sure. Yeah. You know, if you really hustled, what could you do? 10 miles in a day, maybe 15, 
Do you really hustle? And you're walking on sand. And, and they're walking, walking on sand. Their walking shoes weren't very good either. No, nope, that's they right. Were more like sandals, weren't they? Oh yeah, they that that was their shoes. Yeah. Um. All right. So. Um, I went way too far here, but um, so I was else? looking at the file. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, you yeah. you were choppy a little bit. Okay, how about now? Yeah, you're okay. Okay, um, I was looking at that word defile, and. Um, it's more of a ritual impurity than that they're concerned about than just being dirty, you know, like washing your hands. We think of it as being clean, clean for health reasons, but they're talking about ritual Im impurity. And really, you know, you kind of have to feel, this is where I feel sorry for the Pharisees a little bit because this is all they know about, you know, how to, how to stay in, relationship with God is to be ritually pure and they have you know there there's law that tells them how to do that you know um so yeah yeah so I just uh this is one of those times where the Pharisees are just being Pharisees they're just trying to you know they're they're looking out for what they think is the right thing absolutely they are there is a big focus again if we let them if we let matthew mark and luke be legitimate pick portraits of what first century judaism looks like understanding that there's a polemic against you know the pharisees and the sadducees and stuff but still this is our primary source for what first century judaism looked like and i think along with some other rabbis of that time we can see that Judaism had gotten fairly legalistic. You know, I mean, they, after all, they went, they were told that they went into exile because they didn't keep the laws. <laughs> um, so, and they were disobedient. So there's a big focus on that. And then in particular, the Pharisees seem to have taken the, the ritual laws about that applied to the priests when they go into the temple and they kind of said, this is for everybody type of thing. So they, you know, they had a lot of concern about that. But still, even, you know, Jesus, I think the crazy thing here, Kim, is that Jesus is kind of going against scripture. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, and so the Pharisees would be like, what are you doing, you know? Um, and of course, I think Jesus says you're you're missing the weightier matters, um, and it isn't, you know, what you eat or how you wash your hands that makes you unclean. It's what you say and what you think. Evil thoughts. Well, yeah, there, there's a difference between being ritually ritually impure or unclean yeah. and not washing your hands. I mean, it, you want to wash your hands before you eat, but that's not going to hurt your soul right exactly yeah. exactly yeah it's a good thing to do yeah. <laughs> you don't want to get sick but it isn't going to make you uh un you know unclean so to speak which was a big concern um of people in that day it would seem so well, yeah. especially you know the, the pharisees or the priests if they were unclean they had to go through a purification ceremony yeah yeah which and which took time. Yeah, took time yeah and could cost them the ability to make their income too because <laughs> they couldn't go do they their, couldn't they do go over their work job. yeah they had to take not sickly but uncleanly <laughs> yeah yeah um you know jesus is uh what is he is this law or gospel this paragraph see remember gospels promise good news grace gift uh laws do's don'ts expectations this type of thing so is this law or gospel law he's saying he's saying what the law is yeah right right saying this is what you need to worry about you guys 
you know, what comes out of your mouth and what's in your heart. And um, that's what's going to defile you. So he's affirming the law, but he's affirming the weightier matters of the law. He's not, you know. Um, well, he, so, yeah. he's doing what he does with other instances. He ups the ante on it. So just like uh, hatred is murder and um, lust is adultery. He's kind of upping the ante on what defilement <laughs> means. Yes. And, and the other thing I was looking at was the heart. And that's also a very Old Testament topic, too, that that's what God is interested in is the heart, you know. Yes. Yes, what's like the prophets would say, you you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. I forget what passage that is, but well, it's actually remember. he quotes it in 15 right there. It's in uh 15 7. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> I knew I heard it somewhere. The, yeah, the, it's a good one. I think it's Isaiah. Cited from Isaiah 29 and maybe Ezekiel 33. This people honors me at their lips, but their heart is from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Ross, you were jumping. Well, I was going to say, write, write the law on their hearts. Yeah, that's right. Jeremiah will say, you know, you won't have to teach them. They'll know it in their hearts. Yeah, yeah. 30, what is that? 31, 31, I think. So yeah, so he is he is not only preaching the law, he could be you you guys think you're okay because you keep all these rituals, but that isn't that isn't that's not a hill of beans. Um you know, you need to focus, you need to think about not just what you do, but what you think. And anytime I hear that, I know I'm pretty much toast. <laughs> we all have some interesting thoughts, don't we? All right. So now then we go after that, we jump into this Canaanite woman. Mm -hmm. um, Matthew has this flow together. What does one have to do with the other? Um, some, and some of the folks who have read this this week with me have said, what do these have to do with each other? Well, maybe they don't have anything to do because now we get a change. Um, but one person asked, well, why would the lectionary put these two together then you know but maybe there's maybe there is a relationship i think we should hold on to the fact that maybe matthew as he writes um that there is but now we go up like i say from the sea of galilee to these gentile places in the north and they were also when israel was founded you know, going back to the conquest, they, they, the North, I think this was still part of the Northern tribe area, but I don't know that for sure. That's, let's, let's look up, let's look up Tyre, or let's just look up Sidon. Uh, one of the two leading cities of ancient Phoenicia, Sidon is located 20 miles north of Tyre and the Mediterranean coast of modern Lebanon. Did I say Syria? Messed that up. Um, well, Lebanon in anyway, whatever. So substantial archaeological investigation is not possible because of the modern city on the site, but a crusader sea castle lies some meters offshore on the north side of Sidon, while the ruins of a medieval land castle, da da da, da, da that's it. It possesses a port in her in Let's see. Ah, immediately outside Sidon, stone roundhouses of a Calolithic period have been found in the neighborhood cemeteries of Babylonian to late Roman periods have produced numerous. In the Armana age, 14th century, though. Oh, yeah, it goes way back. I'm trying to get to more. Sounds Jesus. like a really old town. It is, yes. They're still on the throne. Revolt king. But when the Persians reacted, hopeless. 
city was burned and all the rebuilt in that again. And yeah, so it was very, very much uh, taken in by the Hellenistic Alexander the Great. Great. This is really what I want to get at. Um, Prosper Center for Commerce and Learning. So, <clears throat> so this is not like the hub of Jewish thinking. This is the hub of, um, sorry, it took a long time to get there. Um, yeah. Well, it was taken over by so many different people until it got there, though. Right. That's true. Yeah. So no surprise, she meets a Canaanite woman. It's interesting that she would be described as a Canaanite woman. Um, Mark calls her a Syrophoenician woman. Syrophoenician woman. Let's see what. Oh, in the Gospel of Mark, Syrophoenician. Yeah. So what does that tell us? Canaanites, were they, uh, they were the enemies of Israel, weren't they, most of the time? Yeah. yeah. And they were the people that were kind of kicked out when the, <laughs> when the conquest happened, um, but they were folks who typically believed in different gods and this type of thing. But, but this woman, she starts off with the cry of faith. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, son of David. That's a confession. So she's confessing something about who David, is, who Jesus is. And then she cries out in her need. So, so anyway, that's where Jesus is. And then we get this interesting dialogue that usually has everybody scratching their heads. Are you scratching your head? <laughs> Do you feel like Jesus is being a real turkey here? <laughs> <laughs> mean inhospitable I don't know what do you think well at first he was being rigid um, by saying I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel yes yeah. but as she describes her predicament and then goes what the uh, the one I like is and the sentence I like it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs, but then she says yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Yeah, that's it right there. Yeah, amazing, amazing. There are all kinds of ways to look at this. Please, Jews, they, they call Gentiles dogs. Um, I think that that, that, that would be a um, something that they would, you know, they would do. Yes. <laughs> so who's being a who's I was listening to. Oh, I just listened to lots of stuff on this text because it always is a quandary. If if we just let ourselves go for a minute, we could say Jesus is being way too harsh and he's being mean to this woman and yet at the end he finishes by saying you have great faith and mm -hmm. so some people have all kinds of people have come up with ideas some people feel like well this syrophoenician this canaanite woman is actually coaching jesus up like jesus was focused just and he's she's kind of correcting him and it shows the humanity of Jesus and that Jesus could be corrected by a woman. Some people go there. I think that has a lot of problems, truthfully. But, or one person said that, well, she doesn't really correct Jesus, but she corrects his timing. Like when mom came and said, hey, you know, turn these, do something about this problem at the wedding in Cana. And he says, it's not my time. And she says, do what he tells you. Know? So in essence, she says, yes, it is. Well, you know, Jesus is first to the, is the lost sheep of the house of Israel, but then to the Gentiles. And so she's saying, you can, you can help us Gentiles out too, which Jesus was certainly going to do. He died for everyone, but, you know, first Jew, then the Gentile, so that, so that she's speeding up his clock, you know, a little bit, eh, maybe. Um, I 
personally, of course, I'm looking at Jesus as fully God and fully man, um, feeling like Jesus is the preacher and the teacher. And just like, doesn't he say stuff to get people thinking? Like he said to the rich man, go and sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Now, unless we feel like he meant that for every person, then none of us should have anything. We should have sold everything we have. But he knew he knew something about that man. And he he's preaching the law at that point. Remember, I've always said Jesus preaches the law and he is the gospel, but he does preach the gospel too. Well, he's just talked about the law with what defiles you. And now he's hitting this woman with the law. You don't deserve it. You're a Gentile. You're not God's elect. You're not God's chosen. And he, that's true. That's true. When did the Gentile become God's chosen? Yeah. Well, that's what the, I think what One Jesus would say, um, and John would say, hey, God can make out of these stones children of Abraham. So, and Paul would say what makes us children of Abraham is faith in Christ and not ethnic, you know. So it is the Christ event, Karen, that I think does that, you know. Mm -hmm. Now, there were Gentiles who had become Jewish, you know, before Jesus. Um, but there's, there's still that strict division. Mm -hmm. um, the Apostle Paul says that dividing line has been torn down um, in Christ. So, so I don't know, how do you, what do you make, you know, there's different ways for us to look at this. Um, you know, the, and we, and we try and make it more palatable <laughs> that Jesus said, equated this woman with a dog, mm -hmm. you know, now I'm amazed at her reaction. If you called me a dog, I'd say, well, no, you're a dog. You know, who are you? You know, whatever. I would stand up for myself. She doesn't do that. Kind of. She, she then keeps going. She stays engaged with Jesus. And she says, yeah, but even the dogs get the crumbs. Mm -hmm. Even the dogs get the crumbs. And that's all I need is a crumb. That's all I need is a crumb. I'm okay with that. She doesn't say, that's not true. She doesn't say, this is what she could have said. She could have said, well, I've become a Jew now and I fast and I give and I, you know, I read scripture and I do that. How do you, don't equate me with a, the, a typical Gentile. After all, I just said, you're the son of David. You know, she, she could have like defended herself. She doesn't do that. She says, you're right. <clears throat> but all I need is a crumb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, she was doing everything she could to get her daughter fixed. Absolutely. She's in desperate, like, straits. You know, you, you, your kid is hurting. Um, so that's sure she's part of She's being a typical mother. She's, yeah, she's, she's like concerned about her kid. Her daughter to yeah. have help. But even there, she, he, she, wanting to help her daughter, could have defended herself and said, hey, what do you mean? That's ridiculous. And you're the prophet. So, you know, um, Kim yesterday at our staff meeting compared this to Abraham's pleading to God for the, you know, town of Sodom and Gomorrah. If you find this many, if you do, if you find even five and God says, yes, if I find, you know, but notice Abraham's pleading is, hey, if you find enough righteous people, will you do it? That's a little different than this gal's pleading. What does she say? She, have she's one on one. Yeah. Have mercy. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Have mercy. Yeah. Well, I, I think this story, you know, uh, now that we look at it, I think it's a perfect illustration of what Jesus is saying to his disciples before, because he's concerned with their hearts and with what comes out of their mouths. And her heart is for her daughter and relying on Jesus' ability to help her daughter. So relying on Jesus, and that's what comes out of her mouth. 
does that cry for mercy? Yeah. Yeah. And and I was going, I I'm glad you said what you said. I, I got a phone call right as you were saying it, but um you know, he's I don't think he's necessarily saying this for the woman's benefit. I think he's doing this for the disciples' benefit to, you know, to hammer home the what he had just talked to them about what actually defiles. Yeah, interesting. Love that. Yeah, because he's like, this he says to the disciples about that, you know, him sending her away. She's crying out, she's bothering us, she's bugging us. Um, but she hears that, obviously, um, perhaps. But, but she came and knelt before him. So now she kneels in worship, in honor, in, which is, Lord, help me. Lord, you know, is this come to my aid? Yeah. And it's an imperative. Um, and so then he gives gives this the harsh statement. Um, I love that this that this is also for the disciples to see. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> What it seems like one thing she's she is going to get mercy. She Jesus gives her the law and she says, "Thank you very much. Give me a promise. I want mercy. She I want the gospel." Um, Martin Luther is famous for saying, "If your pastor doesn't preach the gospel, you go tell him." And of course, back then they were all men, so I'll use him. But but you go tell him. I didn't hear the gospel today, Pastor, and you guys should tell me that. I hope I never get to hear it, but maybe, you know, some Sunday I'm have, I'm frustrated and I just dump the law on you and don't give you the gospel. It's like, well, thanks for the law, Pastor. I'll try and do better. I didn't hear any good news today, you know. It's, you demand that you get the gospel. You, you know, um, and like I say, I hope you don't ever have to, to do that, but She's like, I'm going to get a promise. I am going to bank on Jesus's mercy. And, you know, I'm not going to let him put, not going to let the law push me away. I'm not going to let Jesus push me away by in the preaching law, which is different than the rich man who went away sad. I think what Jesus wanted is for the rich man to say, Lord, help me. I can't do it, you know, <laughs> and then Jesus would have taken hold. Um, so this woman says, yeah, but really we're all dogs, aren't we? <laughs> we are all, do any of us deserve the mercy of God? Did we, any of us climb up the ladder to a place of stature where we can say, look, God, look what I did. You know, um, I think we're all truthfully. Yeah. Carrie, were you? No. Oh, you, yeah. So, yeah, we're all in that position so can we say too maybe that he's also saying your Canaanite status or your syrophoenician status whatever um doesn't defile you but that's not what defiles you love it yes and the opposite it would be true just because you're you know an Israelite or a Hebrew or a Jewish person, that doesn't make you clean either. Yeah. I can make these stones children of Abraham. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It is. I think that's exactly right, Kim. I think that's exactly right. Yeah. 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 And so to finish it off before we go to Romans, If she, if Jesus was fairly harsh to her, now he switches and gives her the greatest commendation of almost anyone in the pages of the Gospels. I've said this many times. How many times does Jesus say somebody had great faith? Two times. That's right, Carrie. Two times. The other person is also a Gentile, a centurion who 
wants healing for his servant or and and you know jesus says okay i'll come and he says you don't have to come just say the word i know how it works and he says holy moly that's great faith and this woman here has great faith so my question to you is what does great faith look like what is if somebody asks you what does it mean to have great faith um you know i think that's an important question what is great faith according to this story well she's clinging to jesus she's clinging okay. to his word his word of mercy mm -hmm. well, we were talking last week when we said that even even faith the size of a mustard seed is enough to get you into heaven right so there is no great there's faith and there's not faith mm -hmm. there, there's no if i remember correctly we yeah. were saying that there's no on, on the faith scale there, there's no place on there <laughs> where if you're this or more you're in and you're yes just, that's but, right so a mustard seed of faith will save you but yet jesus says this person had great faith so you know <laughs> it's 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 not like faith is a scale where once you get over this point you're in and you're but you know faith is faith but yet he says this is this is great faith so in other words this is real faith this is the faith i'm looking for this is so what do we learn about faith from this story what does it look like um and to me i mean kim you kind of said it it is mercy <laughs> depending completely and solely on god's mercy or on jesus's mercy that is faith mm -hmm. um what is not great faith is well <clears throat> i have faith but i've also checked these boxes jesus you see the difference i mean i believe in you jesus but i've also made sure i did this and did this and did this and did this did i catch all the check boxes checked that's not really relying on jesus that's relying on jesus and you this woman doesn't do any of that. She just says, you're right. I'm a dog. I'll take a crumb. <laughs> um, and Jesus says, that's great faith. Because he, because um, uh, more than anything, and I think that's a perfect transition to Romans. Um, I, um, uh, you know, I, I want to, um, I want to show you show faith. I want I want to show mercy. And this, you know, we get we see the healing immediately. So well, the All other right. thing what the yeah. other thing about that is she doesn't even have the law. She's Canaanite, so she doesn't even have the law to she doesn't have any boxes to check. All she mm. has is Jesus. And 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 a recognition that the one box Jew or Gentile, she can't check the Jew box. <laughs> right. She can't check the I'm God's favored elected child box. Yeah. But she would have her own religions. She box. yes, yes. Although there's a little clue here that she says, son of David. So again, this is where we we don't know because some Gentiles were influenced by Jewish thought and had kind of become followers this is what we see in the gut in the book of acts where we hear about god fears is the term and it's clearly about a gentile but they're called a god fearer so you know we do know that some gentiles had converted to judaism they were never those yet at this you know real Jews. yeah right right um, but they, but some did. So, you know, like the Ethiopian eunuch, he's from Ethiopia and he's reading the prophets and explain this to me, Philip, you know, so, so we do, so she might've had some awareness of Jewish thought and the 10 commandments and all of that, but nonetheless, she certainly doesn't have the um, pedigree. <laughs> she doesn't speaking of dogs she does not have the pedigree um that you know one would think you'd need to have to be in which is the way the world works right i mean you know it's not what you know but who you know and where you go to school 
all right, and all that good stuff. So, okay. Anything else? Uh, while Please you're go. going to Romans, this doesn't really make any difference or not, but I was reading Craig Evans, you know, the Logos guy. Um, yes. Uh, and he said that this story is probably a, a historical thing that happened because it's not favorable. It's not a, it's kind of an embarrassing little story. And yes, uh, I thought that was yeah. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, when, you know, when you dive into the world of the kind of biblical historical criticism folks and, uh, when you've got a saying like this that would have made sense for someone to soften, <laughs> you know, in the tradition, you know, um, you know, or if they were even made, if you're going to make this up, you wouldn't have Jesus saying this, you know. So a lot of people would say, yeah, this is this is more like, you know, has a high degree of um, probability that this is truly historical yeah well even though she was a canaanite woman she must have had heard about jesus and his all his um yeah his healings, healings and miracles and stuff to be able to say this yeah yeah so yeah she i think she believed in him right from the start i i i agree i think she starts off with the confession of faith Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Even in the midst of her desperation for her daughter, mm -hmm. you know, without a doubt. Okay. Shall we go to Romans? Let's see here. That's not Romans. That's not Romans. Let's go to here to Romans. Well, I can do it this way easier. Okay, so setting the stage again, um, you know, getting getting this, uh, helping you know, remember where we are in the book of Romans and what's going on. Um, 9, 10, and 11, really the center of the letter, you know, us Lutherans, of course, we love... Uh, you know, chapter three in Romans um, <laughs> and chapter four and, you know, but some scholars would say this is really where Paul gets at just the, the real gospel, <laughs> the real ramification of the gospel as he starts to talk about why is it that his Jewish brothers and sisters have by and large not received Christ? Why has that? And what he says um, is that a partial hardening has come upon them so that the word will go to the Gentiles. This is his grappling with why this is. Why could this possibly be? So that's what's going on. And now we're pretty far along in that argument. And then we're going to get a couple verses here. And then we have to jump um, down to the end. And But for sake of context and time, I'm going to read through verse six. I asked then, has God rejected his people? Since they so many said no, and they said no, so the Gentiles would come in, and that's happening now. Yay, now has God rejected his people? He says, by no means, for I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, um, one of the offspring of Abraham. So now he's talking about, you know, pedigree. <laughs> um, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. So this is that he predestined. He, he chose them. They are the apple of his eye. I'm choosing this people to be a blessing to all the world. For uh, do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he appeals to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets, they have demolished your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. So, in addition to saying Paul 
the bulk of my people have rejected their, he has chosen a remnant by grace, not on the basis of works. Otherwise, it would be no longer grace. So, so no, the, it hasn't all, isn't all lost for his Jewish brothers and sisters. Um, but this little phrase in verse six, which we're not even going to have on Sunday, is just too delectable <laughs> to, to pass up because it gets at grace, real grace. Everybody talks about grace. Like, give me a little grace. Cut me some slack, you know. Uh, be about some grace. But look what Paul, but if it is by grace, then it's no longer on the basis of works. If it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Um, it isn't a combo. If it's grace and works, it's not really grace. You can't have it. It's either you got it by works or you get it by grace. It isn't, there is no combination here, which is the part of the Reformation argument between, and still the argument between us and the Roman Catholic Church, us and the Latter-day Saint Church, us and the evangelicals, um, you know, and many others who say it's, you've got to accomplish something in addition to faith um, and, and, and grace. So no, this is God's gift. It isn't, I mean, if it's a part of my work and, and then a part of God's grace, it's not really grace. It would no longer be grace if, if it's on the basis of works. So anyway, so we, but just for time, we, he's talking about the Gentiles are grafted in. Let's see, where does our, um, our text uh, 29 is where they want to start, but I, I go a little further, but anyway, we'll go back to this. So we'll jump down and the Gentiles are talked about, they're grafted in. Um, and the problem that the Gentiles are going to have, okay, now we're in. Now we're the favored people. So what as human beings, since we're, we also have an old nature at work in us, what are we going to start to think? They can. <laughs> yeah, look at us. And those horrible Jewish people, they rejected Christ. They killed Christ. We, you know, blah, blah, blah. We start to think that we've got a leg to stand on. We don't. And Paul says, we are Gentiles. You're, you're not even a part of the olive tree. You're a wild shoot that's been grafted in. Now, if you start getting proud, look at this in uh, verse 21, or end of 2021. So he says, if the Jewish people have been broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So, so you're part of the tree by faith alone, not because you've done anything that no, you didn't check off any boxes. You don't have the pedigree. That's right, you know, from the start. Um, don't become proud, but fear, for God did not spare the natural branches. He won't spare you either. What is he saying? If you get puffed up, he can cut you off just like he cut them off, because God is not going to let us be a part of the tree by our own accomplishments or our own pedigree. It's going to be a gift. It's going to be, note, and so then note here, this kindness and the severity of God. So Paul says, God is kind. What is that word? Goodness, kindness of God and the severity of God. What is he and how is he severe? Um, severity toward those who have fallen, but kindness toward you provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. What is he saying here? I think he is saying that if you keep depending on his mercy, you have God's kindness. But if you start getting puffed up, thinking you're all of this and that, 
that you're a part of the church because you've done a basically good job and you're not like all those other horrible sinners out there. You're going to encounter the severity of God. So do you want God's kindness or do you want God's severity? If you want God's severity, keep thinking that you're in because you've done something and keep taking pride in your accomplishments. If you want the kindness of God, rely on his mercy. This is where we go back to the Syrophoenician, the Canaanite woman. Why did she have great faith? She completely banked on God's mercy. None of her righteousness. Um, so, and again, we're not reading all of this, <laughs> but we got to read it if we're going to study it here. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted back in, for God has the power to graft them back in again. So if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back in to their own olive tree? So no, Paul still believes that even though there's just a remnant right now, that the Jewish people can be absolutely grafted back in. So even though they have said no, Paul believes there will be a yes, or there can be one. And again, he's wrestling now, I believe inspired by the Spirit, but nonetheless, he's wrestling to try and figure this out. Um, well, Luther thought for a long time he could bring the Jewish people in. Absolutely, he did. His early writings with the Jewish folks was kind, benevolent, caring, at the end of his life, you know, he writes these horrible, harsh words. And what happened for him is he gave up on their yes. And he should never have done that. You know, he blew it. <laughs> but for most of his life, he, he held on. Um, the writing at the end of his life on the Jews and their lies or something yeah. like along. Most people also don't know, though, that he was writing that in response to a Jewish track on the Christians and their lies. And so he was copying the Jewish track against Christians. So I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying, you know, again, you have to contextualize everything that people do. Um, so, he, so he's going to say a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. So... We don't know how long that is. We're still in that time. Um, and he says this about the Jewish people, which Luther should have remembered when he gave up on them. For the gifts and the calling of God are what? Irrevocable. Now, a lot of Christians today think this is talking about the nation of Israel. Paul does not talk about a nation. He's talking about a people. You know, so... If people are continuing to see themselves ethnic, as ethnic Jewish people, they are welcome to the gospel. And yes, there does seem to be a hardening of this group that is the apple of his eye that he chose from the very beginning to be a blessing to all people. The actual the descendants, biological descendants of, a, of Abraham. Um, you know, but until the fullness of time of the Gentiles. So that's where we are. But he and Paul envisions that they, they will come back in. And so um, at verse 28, as regards to the gospel, they're enemies for your sake. They're enemies for your sake. You get the grace because they didn't want the bread on the table. <laughs> you as the dog gets it. And um, for just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now receive mercy because of their disobedience. No, what did they receive? Mercy. mercy. So they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they may now also receive mercy. You see what it's all about is receiving mercy. Yeah. Is, is he saying that if the Jews had accepted Jesus, we'd be out in the cold? Um, yeah, if the Jews in mass had completely received. Now, I think Paul might be like, I'm sure God would have got it to us some other way, but this is the way he's saying, hey, even though this looks horrible, this is actually part of the plan. 
<laughs> because you don't want, they didn't want the bread. It's getting shoved off to the dogs. Yeah. Yep. And then he says, perhaps, I don't know, the hardest, most wonderful thing in the Bible, in my view. And I know we worked at this, but I want us to wrestle with it some more. Just like Jesus' words to the woman were hard. So he says, for God has consigned all, and this is all, this is not just Jewish. Well, is this just talking about Jewish people or is this talking about Gentile? I see this as talking about all of us to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. So I suppose there's some struggle with the all. Like is since he's talking about, you know, the Jewish people, but but he's talking about Jew and Gentile. So I've always read this as for God has consigned all to disobedience that he might have mercy on all. I suppose some universalists would say, well, see, this is showing that all people are going to receive mercy. I think that's an open question. I don't think that's what Paul's talking about. He's talking about, you know, why is it that you know, some people are rejecting. Um, and the word consigned here, what does the King James say, Ross? Uh, for God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Concluded. Hmm. It's got to be some old definition other than what we normally Yeah, have. yeah. For God has concluded. What? Say it one more time. For God, For God hath concluded them all in unbelief. Concluded them, yeah, like he's 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 he's, he's like established them, concluded them, yeah. Um, so the new the modern is the word for imprisoned, confined. That's the Greek word. I'll put up here a little definition um, to enclose, to cause to happen with the implication of significant restrictions. Um, God has imprisoned us in disobedience? That doesn't make sense. Why would God imprison us in disobedience? Keep us stuck in disobedience, not enable us to be obedient. Obedient to what? The law. Why would he do that? Oh, I got gotcha. you. I don't know. You're going to have to help dig us out of this. Because we're no longer under the law. Because we're no longer under the law, Margo? Yeah. Well, I think one thing is that if we really were only under the law to get our righteousness we couldn't do anything else we couldn't live any part of our life uh you know because we'd be spending all of our time trying to meet the rigors of the law and so in some ways this is a little bit of a freedom to uh you know sin boldly <laughs> it's a little bit of a freedom to have that mercy so that we can have our vocations and our lives and um yes so like paul would say in another letter for freedom christ has set you free you know you know that we're no longer under the custodian um mm -hmm. man I, he's saying i am stuck in disobedience i can't i can't I can't obey, and he's imprisoned me in that. Is that original sin? Mm. Is that original sin? We need to rely upon him not to be stuck under the law. Beautiful, Margot. Yeah, absolutely. He that I think that's a great way to say that. So that since we're stuck in disobedience, original sin, <laughs> um, 
the you know uh, Luther's big argument with Erasmus. Um, Erasmus said that we have freedom or, or the uh, of choice. We can we can choose. In other words, Ra Erasmus said, "Why would God give the law if we couldn't do it?" You know, and it's a logical point. <laughs> I mean, why would God give us the law if we didn't have the ability to do it? And Luther said, well, look at this text as one example. Um, he gave the law so that we would see we are, we're, we're stuck. We can't do it. Um, so we would be convicted of sin, which is Paul says that in other places. So like Margaret, you said, we wouldn't rely on our own strength, but we would rely on God. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's we're getting there. And I think this original sin thing is that we are stuck in disobedience. See, Luther would say we have captivity of the will, our not, you know, or of choice. We we can't choose the right. <laughs> um, we're stuck that way. Um yeah. Trying to think of some some uh examples or like what yeah the people that that have no i uh, you know non-christians make the right choice sometimes too though yes so that they're not they're not stuck i mean no I, I i i don't see how you can be stuck there yes how are they imprisoned in yeah. disobe in disobedience it's if they don't even know yeah. anything about Christians. well if they don't know the law then they don't know they're stuck in disobedience to some degree <laughs> i mean so i think maybe one answer to that is why they're doing the right thing you know what are their motivations <laughs> but even that i don't know there there are people who are not christian who have i think altruistic motivations that you know um does the bible say for where there is no law, there's no sin. Yeah, Paul does say that. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> but I think, but but I think that's where he Paul also says that in Romans 1 that they have there's a conscience, you know, it's written in creation, you know, that um and so yeah. Yeah, that no law, no sin. It's just it's just a definition thing. Mm. If if there's no, if if, if you say this isn't a, there, there isn't no wrong, sense, then. then but but it's still like the the conscience thing. I mean, stealing something or murdering somebody's that that's wrong pretty much everywhere. Right, right, right. It's written in yeah. just the nature of things almost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a law. It's not the Ten Commandments law, but there's a law like in creation or something yeah it's how, how societies have evolved because that was the only way they, they worked you know? right they, they didn't work well if, yeah if everybody's taking everybody's stuff oh that's like today or if people yeah. were killing people oh yeah that's like today or like <laughs> um yeah yeah Paul finishes by saying, oh, the depth and the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. For who knows the mind of the Lord, who has been his counselor or who has given him a gift that might be repaid for him or in for or from him and through him and in him are all things. Tim be glory forever and ever. This is Paul's way of saying this is my best shot, but God's ways are higher than our ways. We can't figure it out. But he is saying very clearly that we are consigned, imprisoned in disobedience, um, that he might have mercy on all. What does that tell us about God? That God does not want us to stand on the law. And this is where maybe going to Ross to your thing about somebody that's not a Christian, even though they are really a good person, they are they're kind of banking that they're a good person, that they're, you know, that I did it. I've been a good person. I, I didn't steal. I didn't cheat, you know, so they're, they're not relying on God's mercy. 
in a certain sense. Whatever God they had, they would be following that the laws of that. Exactly, of that exactly. So whether it's a Christian law, Jewish law, Muslim law, cultural, you know, woke law, you know, liberal law, conservative law, you know, whatever law, political law, social law, you know, whatever it is, um, they're adhering to that, you know. Um, and so, so what God, I think what God is telling us in this passage is that what God wants is for us to, to for this I thou relationship with God, not to be, hey, look what I've done. So accept me, but I'm relying on your mercy 100%. Not 90, not 50, not 30. You know, I'm not hedging my bets. I'm relying completely on your mercy. I, I, I think that's what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. But, hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. What else? So how does this preach to us? How is this good news? I mean, that's kind of what we've been talking about, but maybe that's the way to 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 come down the home stretch here. God doesn't give up on us. God doesn't give up on us. Love it. Love it. Yeah. He sure does. Yeah, he does not give up on us. That's right. That's right. He hasn't given up on his people, the Jewish people, in that regard. And he's made us children and sons and daughters of Abraham by faith. Um, Verse 32, he's just saying that, that human beings have a sinful nature. Mm. And there's nothing you can do about it. Mm. Yes, that's right. Yeah. You're not going to, uh, yeah, I was like, it's kind of like if you're in a, a hole and, you know, we just keep trying to dig our way out and it's just worse. <laughs> you know, if you want to get yourself out of the, the whole stop digging, you know, <laughs> or don't put one foot in your mouth and put the other, you know, and take one out and put the other, that it's kind of like that. Yeah, that's exactly right. The answer is the mercy of God, is Christ. Yeah. And most religions jump in, don't they, to try and give us a shovel to get out. This, this is how you get out. And what God wants is for us to, to let us just, him just pluck us out of the pit, <laughs> you know, and not, not. And, and then, of course, when that happens, we can't say, well, look what I, well, hey, I got, <laughs> look what I did you know and the great thing about that is when you can't say that you tend to be less exclusive of other people because they didn't do as good as you did <laughs> you know mm -hmm. or they don't dress the way you did or they're unclean mm. oh the depths and the riches and wisdom life. yeah love it well, this is our confession every week. We're captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. And then we receive that word of absolution. You know, we get that mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Karen? Well, I just said his grace doesn't fail us. Yeah. His grace does not fail us. Beautiful. I think I'm going to use this, use the uh, term that, um, uh, Lord, can you use your shovel on me now? Help me with your shovel. <laughs> so I don't have to do it myself. He's doing it for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Mm. going to have to think about that image. I think you, I could come up with some pictures for Sunday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our faith isn't is is not a shovel that we use. It's a it's a lifeline that God throws to us or something. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. There, there. I've got to think this through a little bit more, but there's, uh, you know, if you think about the Trinity, sorry, I'm having a little bit of a hard time today. Uh, when you think about the Trinity and the eternity of the Trinity and the eternity of Christ, um, Christ's purpose is he has was eternal then too, right? So oh. I don't know what I'm trying to say here. I mean, this consigned people to sin. We, you know, Christ was the pl was the plan all along. I mean, mm. even from before creation, because he's eternal. Mm -hmm. uh, so mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I don't, I'm not really quite sure where I'm going with that, but. Uh, when we have a hard time with this being consigned to disobedience, it's not like it was just something that happened because two people messed up. There was there was yeah. a, there was always going to be an eternal need for this mercy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, that I, I I think I know where you're. I think this is a good direction to go. It wasn't like after so long of history god decided i just want you i just want to be merciful but he wanted to be merciful from the very beginning right. and this was the way he was ultimately going to do that for sure yeah so it's like flood thing yeah well and the, even the flood thing that's true that's good to think about how does how you know um how does that fit into this scenario yeah hmm I mean, you could definitely look at Adam and Eve with this. They they didn't want to just accept the one limitation. You know, they wanted, you know, to have, they wanted to kind of take God's role. Um, they didn't want God's mercy <laughs> and they didn't trust his word. So yeah, the flood thing is interesting. Yeah. He wanted the power. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, all the adjectives of God, merciful and just, uh, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, that's all eternal. I mean, that is God's eternal nature. And so there has to be something for that to act on. There has to be, you know, if you're going to be merciful, there has to be something sinful to act on you know um, yes right and that's right. what i think that, that's what paul is saying uh let's see i think that's what paul is saying here is that um i can't find it exactly but what um, if we weren't that. sinning there wouldn't be grace you know if yeah, and in fact, Paul says the more sin there is, the more grace. Right, and, exactly. And of course, he has to say, well, don't sin so that there's going to be more grace, but that's that's the way God works. So so now that I'm thinking about Ross's comment and your comment, like um, note this kindness and the severity of God. Kindness when we depend on his mercy, severity when we don't. Flood. Not interested in his mercy. Casting Adam and Eve out of the garden they they you know they were not going to be in that kind of relationship that of dependency right. you know and then you could go, you could trace that all the way through the old testament that he's severe you know <laughs> the people wandered in the wilderness why because they were in disobedience and they were not going to depend on god's mercy yeah. stiff-necked people stiff-necked people which means not depending on god's mercy yeah all right Love it. Well, and then it's perfect that he quotes Job and Isaiah here because we don't understand any of this. It's just too too much for us to wrap our heads around, you know. Yeah, that's that's the great ending right there. It's like, yeah, okay, this is my best shot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Ross. Thank and you. Gary. <clears throat> yeah. All right, let me close this up with the prayer here. Gracious and loving God, thank you for this time in your word. Let it be a blessing. And we give thanks that we are grafted in. And may we never be presumptuous 
um, but always continue in your mercy and we pray this in your mercy and in your love. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <clears throat>